in Japan and how you can do that or not. <laughs> so we will be right back. Please stay tuned. Hi, good morning everyone. It's Tuesday. Beautiful weather here in Hiroshima. How's the weather there for you, Noriko? Yeah, it's also very nice today. I just came back from a walk with the family. Yeah, nice. nice. It's a perfect time of year, isn't it? Where it's starting to get cooler in the morning yeah, and evening. No humidity. <sighs> Love it. <Yeah>. Love <laughs> autumn in Japan. Um, so Noriko Shindo, you're based in Tokyo now, is that right? Yes. But you told me originally you came from Tokushima. Is that right? Yes. I was born there. Technically, I was born there. I think some people from Tokushima might be like, no, you don't belong here. I was born there. <laughs> I went back there every summer for 10 years while um, I lived abroad with my family. So I call myself somebody from Tokushima, but you know. <laughs> I, I love Tokushima. I've been there many times. Um, I did my research for my master's on sustainable tourism. I, I did it on the zero waste town of Kamikatsu in Tokushima. My son also loves um, Naruto, where they have the whirlpools mm. because they have a great skate park and he loves skateboarding. So, <laughs> so we've been back a few times. It's not too far nice. from Hiroshima. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they have the beautiful Setonai, Setonai guy. Yeah. And uh, you've lived in the UK, is it, for a while? Yeah, so after Tokushima, our family moved to New York for one or two years and then moved to London, where I grew up uh, mostly. Uh, so that's how I lived in the UK. Yeah, yeah, nice. So do you think, I mean, running Vegino and your inspiration to start Vegino, you think that is more influenced from living abroad, your time abroad? Could be. I mean, um, I, I really remember when I was what, 10 or even younger, I asked my parents if I could be vegetarian, influenced by my friends, of course, who some of them were vegetarian. Um, there was also an episode when, you know, we went to a farm and I just didn't like the fact that we had to eat them or eat something coming from them. And so, again, I went back to my parents and said, can I be vegetarian? I didn't know about the whole concept of veganism. Um, so I think it was always innately there. And then also um, after coming back to Japan to live here in 2002, um, I actually went back abroad uh, to study. And this was about four or five years ago. Uh, that's when I actually first course, sort of really heard about the term and got to know what veganism is, which for me was like one step further than vegetarian. And I guess that was the final push to explore plant-based life. Nice. And since uh, when you were in the UK, were you trying to be vegetarian and then coming to Japan? What was that switch like? Did you have any hurdles? So ultimately, when we lived in the UK, my parents didn't allow oh, <laughs> me to okay. be vegetarian because I'm not the one cooking. I was 10, 11, right? Um, so I ended up kind of pursuing a, a normal life with, you know, eating a balanced side of everything. Um, and then uh, to the second time when I went abroad, so a couple of years ago, um, I did switch to a 100% plant-based lifestyle while I was living abroad. I was in France at the time. Um, and then coming back from there to Japan, it was interesting um, because, right, it's fair. I didn't know what uh, the word vegan meant or plant-based was before I went to France, right? So I should have anticipated that. Nobody around me would know. Um, but it was a lot more than just that. It's like, have you been brainwashed by religion? What do you eat? And so I quickly realized, okay, there's this awareness gap. Um, also, I'm sure a lot of people watching this might um, have already be plant-based or whatever. And, and it was very hard to find products, services or restaurants. Um, and so quickly when I, when my friends and family grasped the whole notion of plant-based, then the kind of next question is, how do you do it? Like, it's so mendoxai, it's so complicated, it's so blah, blah, blah. So there was all this like perception gap plus 
awareness gap, sorry, and then perception um, that it was just a super difficult lifestyle to pursue. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're you're trying to address that, of course, uh, with Vegino. Can you tell us a bit about Vegino and how it came about? Sure. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I was like, you know, can I do something about it? Um, but it wasn't like I wanted to do my own business or anything at the time, you know, create a product. Um, so I had it in my mind. I didn't do anything about it. And then um, I realized a couple of months after coming back to living in Japan that uh, my mother, who I lived with at the time, she gradually became more plot based. So she was still eating like meat, or fish. But um, before she wanted to have some kind of animal protein three times a day in the meal, like most people. Um, and I realized, wait a minute, sometimes she's sharing 100% plant based meals with me. This is interesting. I asked her why. And she's like, actually, you know, it's it's fine. It's it's actually I feel better, lighter. And I've realized you don't actually need the necessarily need three times a day um, animal protein. The other thing is my friend, um, also from the same school I studied with a couple of years ago, um, he also was a, you know, a, not a believer, but he loved meat, especially chicken, to the point that, again, he wanted it three times a day. And somehow he had started to explore vegetarianism. And when I asked my mother, when I asked him what was going on, they were like, you know, you made it sound so easy and fun and even healthy good for you, blah, 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 that, I don't know, we didn't see why we shouldn't try or start doing it. And that's when I realized, you know, maybe that's what I want to do, which is sort of just by sharing how easy or fun or healthy or kind of just sharing my, what I'm doing, my experiences, tips. Um, I realized that, hey, people can actually be nudged to try more. Um, so let's do that on the internet instead of just one-to-one -one with family and friends. And that's kind of how I started Vegino. Um, it was going to be a pers very personal blog, but then that very same friend said, why not just turn it into a, more of a structured website where you have blog as well, but you can also have recipes and try to, you know, actually help people who are then nudged to try. Um, so that's kind of how it came about. Oh, great. And you are, I noticed in a recent article, you talk about uh, starting it, of course, with a team. It's not just you doing it. Can you introduce the team? Sure. So that friend that I've just keep, kept referring to, he's called Jad. Um, he's one of the team. So he's the one who kind of suggested, you know what, I'll make the website more structured. He's more savvy with all these things. Um, and so he joined uh, my husband. Um, is has been uh, plant based for most of his life, and that's he's the my inspiration to go plant based. Um, so he was happy to join the team, um, and then we had one other person also from our school um, who at the time was not plant based at all, but was interested in joining because he believed in the potential that uh, it would be. Um, better for the environment and society, even though he wasn't doing it, which was interesting. Um, what I think is cool, though, is that last guy, he's called Eddie. Um, recently, I've heard that uh, he has turned pretty much 100% plant-based uh, after Corona, I hear. But um, yeah, that's the team. Um, I do, in, honest, in all honesty, I do a lot of the writing. But um, like I said, the website, the structure um, is helped a lot by the team. Um, and sometimes they bring, you know, recipes and articles too. So uh, it's a fun thing to do. That's great. And I saw in January you did an event. Uh, usually it's just keeping up the blog and Instagram page, it looks like. But in January you did Is Plant-Based Ethical? How did that event go? Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so... Um... It's unfortunate we had Corona because from around the end of last year, we started um, planning out meetups uh, where we would get together or at least um, invite people in small groups. So we capped it always at 10. We would go to a restaurant. Uh, I think we did it twice where January was the ethical one. Um, and we just wanted to create like an opportunity for people who are interested and kind of on the edge to just talk and find out more with uh, delicious food that could be 100% vegan or it could be, you know, a restaurant that has a nice choice of both. Um, but yes, it's due to Corona partly. Um, but also I was actually a couple months pregnant at the time. And so it was both of those things came together and we're like, okay, let's take a break from the meetups for a bit and concentrate on, on um, 
doing stuff on the internet. So, yeah. yeah. But it was interesting to um, realize that a lot of people, um, I think, are quite aware of, at least um, especially today, the implications of the environment, uh, on the environment. But still, um, I guess in Japan also, it's not easy to visually see the impacts of it on the animals themselves. And so uh, if you're already vegan, you know the ethical side of all of this. But if you're not, then it's like, wow, really? In Japan, um, especially because you see all the koksan made in Japan labels on you know, chicken or eggs or, or flour. Uh, so I think it comes as a bit of a shock when you tell people, especially Japanese people, that koksan might actually be worse uh, for you. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of issues that I think definitely could do with more attention in Japan in terms of sustainable food systems. Like even the idea of sustainable seafood is quite new, um, even though Japan eats a lot of seafood and fish. So hopefully, you know, slowly, slowly, these ideas are kind of coming from abroad, but there are, if you look back 20 years in Japan, there are these ideas kind of embedded in the way Japanese culture used to be as well. So there's a lot of modern changes for convenience sake, which may be less good than uh, what was happening in the past. But you mentioned uh, pregnancy, so it's a good time to talk about uh, your pregnancy. You wrote a, a brilliant article about being vegan or plant-based during pregnancy. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So um, before I was pregnant, I was already 100% plant-based for about two, three years. Uh, when I found out I was pregnant, you know, there was always the, should I continue this way or not? Um, and I thought, I'll do it as long as I feel okay. I'm not going to put myself or the baby at risk. Um, I'll also tell the doctor. And um, I was aware that maybe these cravings might shoot in. So it's my first pregnancy, for those of you who don't know. Um, and so I was like, maybe I'll have cravings. And some of the cravings might be like meat or cheese that, you know, cannot be satisfied maybe with plant-based alternatives. Um, so I thought, let's just see how it goes. And interestingly, I had zero cravings of any kind. So I'm not going to say that's because of the plant-based diet. I think it is, but, you know, I always think that. Um but yeah, I just didn't have any cravings. And so that never happened. Um, and also, interestingly, I was doing really well the whole time. Um, again, I like to attribute it to the plant based diet, um, as I always do when it gets to healthy stuff. But um, yeah, it just I never just uh, had to run into that like crossroad of, OK, is this something that I should stop doing for me and the baby? And so until the very last day, everything went well. And voila. Um, we got a lovely baby who size wise and development wise, right on the curve, um, as was my weight. So everything was fine. And uh, I actually loved the experience because I had no problems associated typically with pregnancy, yeah. uh, including cravings. Yeah. I think that's also an, a tribute to your excellent dietary style, right? Like you are eating. Mm -hmm. It's not only non-meat, non-dairy, you are eating yeah. very whole foods, very leafy greens, very, you're focused on eating healthy. And I think uh, people shouldn't simplify it to just not eating meat or not eating fish and being healthy during pregnancy. You, you talk a lot about having to be careful about getting the right nutrition um, from the plant-based diet. And I think it, looking at your blog and looking at your Instagram, and the kinds of things you're eating, really good balance of nuts and leafy greens and, and beans and, and loads of things which have a very balanced diet, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, um, there's all kinds of vegan or plant-based. So I like to say plant-based and I try to add the word whole foods. Uh, in Japanese, that's a bit difficult to translate. So I just basically say plant-based. Um, but you're absolutely right. Like just because you're omitting food, uh, meats and, and cheese, which in and of itself can be unhealthy. Um, but just because you omit that doesn't mean, okay, I'm just going to go and eat whatever is labeled plant-based or vegan. That won't help. But that's the same as anything, right? Like if someone says to you, I think these days there's a whole thing about sausages being sort of cancerous or they have carcinogens um, just because you omit sausages if you start eating more fries <laughs> in your diet or something you know just because you omit something doesn't mean that your diet suddenly shoots up and becomes healthy so same thing with plant-based um, I absolutely agree 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, if anybody goes to Vegino's website or Facebook page or Instagram, they can see loads of great recipes that, that you're doing, you're putting up. Um, it looks like you're a big fan of gyoza. Can you tell us about your vegan gyoza? It looks amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's um, basically I hated gyoza. It's kind of interesting. I never ate gyoza before I went plant based, and I come to think of it, maybe I didn't like the meatiness, the meaty smell. Um, but when I started making gyoza in plant based, I I actually love it now. Um, to the point that as you you'll see two kinds of recipes on the website. Uh, one is what I call like proper gyoza, um, which I think is takes a little bit more time, but actually is worth it. And the other one is kind of an easier version. Um, but yeah, now I love it. And interestingly, same thing happened for lasagna. So I never used to like lasagna, but probably because of the meatiness, now I love it. And uh, shepherd's pie, if if everyone knows what, it's, it's a British dish, but it's basically minced meat topped with uh, mashed potatoes and baked in the oven. So it's interesting what these uh, omitting meat actually opened doors to. Yeah. I um... I was vegetarian for many years, and like you, I had uh, two pregnancies in Japan as a vegetarian. And one of the things that they were, the doctors were very concerned about, and people around me, which it, it sounds like you had the same comments, is are you going to have enough, um, what is it, vitamin A, the kinds of things that people always worry about with not eating, eating meat or fish. And they were very careful to check my bone density and my blood tests and everything. And they didn't find any problems whatsoever. Um, well, you, sounds like you were also very careful like for the, the blood tests and stuff and talking to your doctor. Um, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things, the medical people were saying to you when you had your checkups and sure interestingly for the pregnancy it might have been the hospital I chose I didn't get too much scrutiny um but maybe because of that um and this is also outside the pregnancy I do try to do extra blood checks and I do strongly recommend it to anyone who's vegan or vegetarian um because it is true that if you're not careful you can get lower on things like vitamin a vitamin d vitamin b12 um, I guess those are the main ones. Calcium, actually, not so much. Um, and so if you go to, you know, your yearly checkup that your company pays for or, or you pay for, um, those things are typically not included in the like the standard check. Um, so every year I make a note to uh, at the same time as the standard check, get extra blood drawn. Um, and so at the time of pregnancy, I kind of anticipated a similar thing where, you know, I, I'd have to either ask for extra checks or the doctor will be strict about everything. The doctor was not. Um, and so I kind of asked the extra questions and said, you know, like, is the baby fine? Um, at one point, my weight wasn't increasing at all for like two, three uh, months. And so I did, to be honest, I did get a bit anxious. And so I did ask those extra questions like, hey, is the baby in there? Okay. Does it have 10 fingers, 10 toes? Like, you know, um, but yeah, it, it was just, I think, um, just be mindful that it is true what they say. Uh, it's, it's easier to sort of go drop lower on some nutrients. But if you're mindful of that in your diet and then also to check that with the doctor uh, outside of pregnancy or in pregnancy, I don't think it should be a problem. Yeah, that's great. And it's great you found a, a good, very supportive medical institution that supported your choice, you know, and it, it also, yeah. maybe that's also a credit to the progress being made in Japan as well, right? Uh, it's been 14 years since I had my last child. So hopefully things are a little bit better now, a little bit more open minded. Yeah, I mean, also, maybe the, the doctors don't really um, say much unless you're starting to get overweight was my impression. So um, this was because I did a lot of searching on the internet and it kind of feels like if you start going above the curve in terms of mother weight and whatnot, they will start, you know, trying to give you, um, dietary recommendations. But because I was kind of on the lower end to just on the curve, I guess that's probably why nobody said anything. Um, and you're, yeah, you're very the... lucky then that you're not a big Western woman like myself. Um, all, all my friends and me were constantly berated every check-in for gaining too much weight. 
because it's, <laughs> it's on the Japanese standard. And uh, then I kept meeting、uh, Japanese friends who said, Well, you never tell them your true weight at the very first check in. They always ask you, How much did you weigh before pregnancy? And they always lie and say they didn't gain any weight at that first check in, is the weight that they tell them. Whereas I was, I was training for a triathlon before I got pregnant the first time. So I was very honest that I had already gained 10 kilograms before my first check in at four months or five months. <laughs> and then they're like freaking out, you're gaining too much weight. And oh, <laughs> such a pain. So you're lucky you didn't have that. Or maybe they've, they've updated their advice about weight gain and just, you know. Yeah. You said you didn't have、uh, preeclampsia, you didn't have any, any cramping or pains or anything. So it sounds like you were very healthy, had a great pregnancy. Good for you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And、uh, so on the website, too, of course, during stay at home, a lot of people are making breads. It looks like you got really into making some sourdough. Can you tell us about making bread? Yeah, it's the classic Corona yeah, baker classic. thing, I guess. <laughs>、um, actually, it was before Corona that I started baking、um, bread, past things like, you know, mix and, mix and bread, bake, things like、uh, banana bread.、Um, so I started exploring with bagels and baguettes. The reason is kind of to do with plant based because、um, it was, it's hard enough to find bread, it's hard enough to find food. 100% uh, free of animals, and then we quickly realized bread is really difficult.、Um, even if they don't have obvious things like milk and eggs,、um, ones when we checked with something that looked pretty harmless in terms of you know, didn't have any animals,、um, they were like, Actually, lard is on the list. And I said, What is lard doing in a whole wheat baguette? And I said, Well, don't be surprised, it's kind of common in Japanese bakeries to add lard for the umami. Um, and sort of give it the depth or whatever. And then since then, I'm like, I'm not going to keep on asking every time it's not on the allergen list on the label whether it has lard or not. Like, I just, I, I'm somebody who can't be bothered to do like all those checks.、Um, and that's kind of how I got into baking anyway. But then Corona really sort of sparked that. And、um, I guess the reason was because I didn't really like the、uh, single use sort of individually wrapped yeast. Um, but if it's not individually wrapped, then for you bakers, maybe you know if it's if you're buying bulk, it just quickly goes bad. And so I was like, maybe there's a better way. And then I started looking on the internet, and boom, you have sourdough, which is basically、uh, live yeast that you just cultivate in your house and you keep alive.、Um, and then it goes from there. I just,、uh, even now, I bake、um, twice a week, maybe like a whole loaf. And we get through it pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, it's great.、Um, that was actually that was a, a time during coronavirus, was when I started making bread every day, too.、Um, <laughs> that, it was because I was trying to, I think、um, Melissa Galengser was talking about doing a plastic audit in her house. And that inspired me to look at my home and how much plastic I'm using and where does it come from. And it was bread. It was the plastic bread wrapping. And so I was like, well, maybe I should bake more, you know? And then I got the bread machine out that I haven't used for ages and、uh, started baking every day. And I got, I got the big thing of yeast and keep it in the fridge and, you know,、um, got a huge paper bag of flour from Costco or a baking shop, you know? So you can really reduce. How much plastic if you start making your own bread? Plus, when we tried at the beginning of this year because of Veganuary,、mm. we tried to be more vegan. My son and I were challenging.、Um, I realized all the bakeries, like you said, all the bakeries in Japan, they either are using、uh, milk or eggs or butter or lard. And so basically, you can't buy from a bakery anymore. So I was like, another reason to start baking every day, you know.、Um, they're getting better, like you said, about listing allergens, but sometimes they don't list if they're using lard or, or something.、Yeah. So hopefully that'll improve. But also, having fresh made bread every day is such a treat, right? And the smell、yeah. that takes over your house is so wonderful. I love it. 
Yeah, so do I. I mean, it's funny, we have a very fussy dog who is the only non-vegan in the house. Um, she won't eat carrots or peanut butter, which typically all dogs are supposed to like, but she loves the sourdough bread. Wow, that is interesting. I never really thought of that. We adopted some cats, and, and as vegan vegetarian family, that's one of the the things mm. I, I often, I hate buying the fish or the meat for the dog, the cat food, right? Um, yeah. But that seems unavoidable. So, you know, knock it out. Well, at least we're not buying it. So we're reducing our amount that we're putting demand on um, the fish industry. Anyway, they like they like the fish base. So at least I don't have to buy the meat anymore. Mm. It also looks like you have made some beautiful falafel. <laughs> yeah. We did. So that one's also interesting. Um, so my husband is from Israel and the, the first friend I mentioned, Jad, my husband is called Ofer. Um, I forgot to say his name. And then uh, my first friend that I mentioned at the beginning, he's called Jad. Um, they're both from the Middle East. And so two out of four of our team is, is kind of Middle East. So we do have a bit of a Middle East influence. If you look at our Instagram every now and then, we like to eat hummus and chickpeas. Um, and falafel is one of those things that if you know, or if you've been to any of the countries there, it's, um, I don't know, maybe the equivalent of like takoyaki in Japan. Nobody really makes them at home seriously. Uh, it's a lot cheaper and tastier if you buy them outside. And falafel in the Middle East is kind of like that. I mean, it's a lot more nutritious, I think, than takoyaki, but, you know, packed as protein. Um, but yeah, nobody bothers to make them at home. However, um, my mother is a big fan of it. I'm okay with it, but I wouldn't make it at home. My mom, uh, she loves it. And so she just started to make it. She, I will share the recipe, actually, because it's very easy. Um, but she was always frying it. And when you look at her frying it or, you know, in the frying pan, it's a lot of work. Uh, so I said, I, like I said, I'm always doing mendoxai. I don't want to do a lot of things. So I just, uh, popped it in a donut. What do you want to call it? The uh, tins, cans, put it in the oven and it actually came out even better than the fried and healthier. So now we're sticking to that. <laughs> That's a great idea. I'd never thought of that before. And I saw that, um, like, where do you get your chickpeas? You're a fan of Alishan Tengu. I saw you mention them a few times. They were, of course, in the series as well, uh, number five. And uh, they're a huge resource for anybody living in Japan, uh, trying to be vegan, vegetarian. You also found some noodles that I'd never heard of through Alishan, so I've I've looked that up. Um, you were using it in like a noodle salad, it looked like? Yeah. yeah. Chinese Chinese noodles? I think they're Chinese. So I, I love Alishan, yes. Um, we do actually source a lot of things from Alishan. Like the whole wheat flour I use for baking, five kilos. I shouldn't say this because then I'll run out of stock and then I won't know where to get them. But five kilos of whole wheat baking uh, flour on them is like 1,700 yen. Um, so, you know, they're a great source to go for, for chickpeas, flour, noodles. And what I love about some of their products like, uh, noodles, and I think some of the staples is they write a, like a recommended, uh, recipe or a recommended way to cook them. And I think what you saw from the Instagram was one of them where basically I just did what was written with the noodles and it went really well. So great source to go to. Um, and also we use a lot of Amazon as well. It's kind of, you know, bulk or price or what we want, balancing that out. Yeah, one of the recipes that they suggested for these noodles, and it looks like the noodles are from Taiwan. Now that's been a real resource of vegan food in Japan is, uh, I've often been into restaurants and say I'm vegetarian or vegan and they say, oh, do you want the Chinese vegan or Chinese vegetarian menu? I was like, sure, I'll take whatever vegan vegetarian menu you have, you know, um, because a lot of tourists who were coming in from Taiwan were asking for plant-based foods in Japan. So actually the Chinese inbound market has really helped to increased demand and supply um, from Japanese tourist destinations, airport restaurants, that kind of thing. So I was really interested to see that the noodles um, that you used in the salad, they also, Alishan recommends using it in lasagna. Mm, I'm sure that'll go well. Oh it's, uh, my gosh. Really, 
it's kind of like the fr- it has the frills like a uh, typical lasagna would have so definitely yeah that looks beautiful <laughs> I'm gonna have to try that yeah so um we noticed that at our vegan place in Hiroshima as well Saishoku Kenbi um they have like imported vegan or vegetarian meats which are frozen and they're from Taiwan as well yeah I've I really want to visit Taiwan because I heard they have 3,000 vegan restaurants in Taiwan that it's a yeah. great place for vegetarians so I I'd, think I haven't been there either but I, I, I agree it's one place that I think would be a haven my friend is Taiwanese and she mentioned that I think 30 or 40 percent of their population is at least vegetarian because of uh Buddhism I won't go into Buddhism but there's so many different branches and the main branch that they have in that country is um part of it the belief is to to not eat or to kill or to basically be dependent on animals at all uh which overlaps with the concept of veganism so that's why they have a lot of businesses and foods and yeah yeah but it is a very different kind of vegetarian vegan than you'll find in Japan I love Japanese vegan vegetarian restaurants because it's very whole foods kind of connected to fresh fruits and vegetables locally produced quite often the macrobiotic scene is quite good in Japan right um, whereas in Taiwan it's more of the Chinese vegetarian style so a lot of things are made to look like meat like mm-hmm. made made to look like chicken or made to look like fake meats and it's and like maybe similar to what you were talking about it's kind of nice to aim for whole foods and have that as like your main staple for a healthier diet so I really like a lot of the things that are on offer in Japan for sure yeah so do I and I think um we actually were vegetarian I wouldn't say we were vegan um we're surrounded by seasoned fish but we were very much kind of like a vegan plus fish so not even pescatarian uh, especially in the Edo period um, when there was there's different regions but um, sorry periods but there was bans on eating killing for food um, there was also bans to hunt um, so there were all sorts of um, historical contexts that I guess made it so plus the fact that we're surrounded by fish um, that you know in effect if you look back in history most of the time we've been very very much plant-based and we have a lot of abundant um, uh, vegetables and plantations, some of them are indigenous. Um, I know a lady who's um, doing a project to try to save these because if nobody eats these species, then they just die out. Um, but I, yeah, I really believe that. Um, and that's kind of also the reason that um, I'm passionate about doing the Gino is because I believe that uh, eating plant-based is not actually an alien concept for us Japanese people. We've been we have been doing it a long time. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame that we're sort of shifting in general to a more Western or non-Japanese uh, cuisine. Yeah, no, I love it. And I love following your recipes. And I see in this one I'm showing on screen now, uh, you're showing a soba dish where you also use kurumafu. So mm. the dried, can you describe kurumafu and how you use it in cooking? Yeah, I like to say it's the Japanese Satan, but it's not as chewy as, as Satan. Um, it's made out of wheat glutton. Uh, it's called fu. And then kurumafu is just one type of it. Um, so it looks like a, a wheel of a kuruma, a car. Um, and I guess they make it like the bam kuchen and then they cut it up. It's dry foods. You can find it in the dry foods section of any supermarket um, with all the other types of food. And what I like about kurumafu is it's big. So all the other types of food is smaller. Um, so it's big and then really easy to, to make. You just uh, soak it in water, I don't know, five minutes until it really soaks. Then you can, uh, like a sponge, just um, take out all the water. And then instead of the water that you just took out, you then put in and soak it, whatever flavor you want. Um, you can fry it, you can eat it as is after you've soaked it in water. Um, you know, you can put it in soup. It's it's really versatile. Um, one of the recipes you can find on Regino is pancetta. So like, uh, I, I managed to make fake um, pancetta. It's not as chewy as the real bacon, but you, you can make it quite uh, crispy and nice in the oven. And that's made out of kurumafu. So I, I love kurumafu. Um, and because it's made out of wheat uh, glutton, uh, wheat protein, 
it does have it can be a protein source as well wow great sounds awesome i have to try it um, my 18 year old son is really into cooking now and he's trying loads of japanese recipes using kurumafu or the soy chunks the dried ones and uh, soaking it in a kind of marinade and then deep frying it or roasting it and stuff i love it he's so adventurous and wow. uh you know i think being being a mom maybe i'm i have some standard recipes that i always do i do a lot of pasta i do lentil burgers you know like you just have certain ones that you always do um yeah. so it's so exciting for me that my 18 year old is so adventurous you know <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Nice. Take up some I'd love of the to slack. Get some of the recipes too. You know, oh. you know uh, if you want, you can submit recipes on Vigino. It's yeah, not too yeah. well known, and we don't really advertise it. But um, it's not just about us. Um, you know, sharing recipes. I think if you have any easy ones and fun ones or tasty ones. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Um, also on your website, you also have a. Uh, what is it? You can subscribe to the newsletter. So put your email and then get the latest updates. So that's a good idea. Yeah. On, on the website I'm showing here, um, you've got different articles, plant-based 101, uh, soup recipe, social impact. So plant-based uh, kind of information, recipe, social impact, health and nutrition, restaurant review and events. So I, has anything changed since coronavirus? Have you shifted kind of the focus of any of these? Yeah, I guess, um, like I said, sadly, we haven't been doing any events. So that section is pretty blank. Um, and we didn't really put up anything to do with the lead up there, um, partly because of, of time. So all of us are doing this like sort of as a side project from our actual day job. Um, and so every time, you know, we think of an event, it's already done. And so, you know, we advertise it on Meetup and Instagram, but then it kind of just floated away. Um, but yeah, after, during Corona, I think we focus more on sort of blogs and recipes, especially with blogs. Um, I think there's two articles in there about like the effects of, or maybe one about the effects of um, Corona or sorry, the effects of eating animals um, and its link to Corona and also influenza. Um, just because let's not forget Corona might be a one-time pandemic or hopefully it's a one-time pandemic. Um, but uh, influenza is something that, you know, we see every year and that actually, I don't know how many people are aware, but that's also um, an animal origin uh, virus. So if it weren't for farming animals in the way that we do today, we may not have uh, all these streams of influenza every year. Yeah. It's really important to keep searching for information and update your database about uh, what's the latest about nutrition and about information about environmental impact and sustainability for sure. Um, I recommend that. And of course, we talk about that a lot for lots of different subjects, right? Like it's, it's always good to just keep in mind what is the best option for your life, right? And then try to reassess do an internal audit and then make better choices next time, right? And it, you, you have to do it in a positive, realistic way. Yeah. Um, I really, I feel that for sustainability as well as for being plant-based. Is that kind of your philosophy or? I agree. Like we, I think one of the things I think is that if more people were, you know, vegetarian or part-time vegetarian or whatever, all these words out there, pescatarian, Basically, you know, you reduce your animal dependency and you increase um, getting your nutrients from plants. I think if more people did that, it'll be a lot faster and a lot better and a lot more impactful than if, you know, we're trying to get more people to, I don't like to use the word convert, but, you know, become 100% uh, plant-based slash vegan. And so I think, you know, people should be allowed to choose. I do strongly think that 100% is the best way to go, but that doesn't mean that you know, if you're not doing 100%, you should be judged like it's not sustainable if, you know, everyone has to keep on doing it. Um, like you mentioned, I get some of my stuff from Alishan and some they import stuff. I'm not against importing altogether. But again, it's not the best way if you think about, you know, carbon footprint, do you want to get things shipped all the way from Taiwan is close, but like, the United States, it's quite far away. So, you know, it's a balance. Like I prioritize trying to stay plant-based the most and then kind of try to reduce other things, other impacts from there, like 
plastic and, and local. Um, so yeah, I, I think we shouldn't judge, uh, do the best we can. Yeah, to do for better. sure. Yeah. yeah. Be supportive of any small effort that people are making, you know? I, I think people, especially vegans, vegetarians, have a reputation of being like soapboxy and telling people, don't do this, do this, you know? And I, I don't think that anybody I've met is like that, to be honest. I think most people are like, yeah, you got to do what you can. Or, you know, you're cutting down just meatless Mondays. Good for you, you know? Like, I, I haven't really met people who are like that. And I think in the real world, you have to do what fits your lifestyle. And you were talking about that for pregnancy as well. You know, you have to do what suits you and your family and your situation. Exactly. Like, I was willing to eat meat if, you know, I really craved it or the doctor said that's the only way to go. Um, although I don't think the science points that way. But, you know, I was willing to do that if need be just didn't happen so yeah I think we should just try to do what we can uh, to yeah. the extent we can and and just be like you said just be supportive of any any effort that people are making you know any any effort of course makes a big difference in terms of sustainability as well as you know their personal journey and their personal health uh, one thing that I, I talked to Nadia about who runs uh, as a vegan activist in Tokyo who runs Tokyo vegan um, do you think that veganism has changed or vegetarian options have changed in the last few years since you've been kind of focused on vegino? Have you seen some progress? Yeah, so I think um, one of the, the benchmarks that I like to notice the mentions in the Nikkei newspaper. Um, they have Nikkei, like the main newspaper, and they have like MJ, which is market. Uh, I forgot what it stands for, but sort of they try to look at market trends. And in both uh, their sort of uh, medium, I do see a lot more mentions of, they don't always call it vegan. Um, sometimes they call it like shokubutsu something, so plant-based. Uh, sometimes they call it uh, meat alternatives, but whatever word they use, um, I see a lot more of it now, uh, focused on products, focused on research. So I think that's definitely something to note. Um, in terms of restaurants, it's a bit hard because corona, with Corona, some restaurants suffered. Um, but I think in general, I've seen more choices um, and surprising choices in restaurants that were never, you know, even vegetarian friendly. Sometimes you see like the V mark and you're like, is this what I think it is? And Voila, you know, they've added an option. So definitely things have changed. Um, one thing I do worry about, though, is that maybe because it's been quite quick, and I'm sure Corona expedited the awareness, um, maybe in Japan, the word vegan or plant-based is being misunderstood. Uh, so that's something I, I worry about a bit now, but that can be, I guess, course-corrected um, as more people find out about it. Yeah, and you recommend some excellent companies and stuff. Um, that you have heard about and you've tried out. So, for example, you recommended Vegan Factory, the cake cake shop. Yeah, she. I think it's a uh, it's a uh, just one woman doing it. Um, her baking, uh, she bakes. So she's like a patisserie. She bakes bread, but she also makes cakes. Um, and I love her concept. Um, also, her lemon tart was amazing, but. Uh, because she sent me the box with the cake um, and it's a two pager that comes with it on one page it's written like half the page of this is the tart you know refrigerate and blah 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 the usual stuff that comes with food you turn it over and there's a full page and she's written about the impact of plastic consumption on our planet and uh, she's also recommending some sources and I actually wrote to her and said wow it's amazing that your passion for plastic re reduction <laughs> goes beyond your product explanation. So, um, yeah, amazing woman um, and amazing food. And she delivers around Japan, does she? I believe so. Mm -hmm. um, you can find her, I think. Um, so we follow her on Vegino on Instagram, and you can find her. She's called Vegan Factory Yuka or Vegan Factory. Um, she's also on uh, Minni, which is a Japanese ap application, MI. N N E. It's like a Japanese app that gets together um, people who small businesses or people who do handcrafts, and it includes food. So I think you can find it on those two. 
Wow, great. And uh, I'm putting on screen right now two other talks that I've done recently. So I talked to the Organic Farm and Cafe Hive and Barrow. And it's very interesting because she does like ready-made soups or dips and stuff, which is sold in some markets in Tokyo. And she doesn't label it as vegan, but it's absolutely vegan. So we had an interesting discussion about um, like I and I come across this in Japan, and I'm sure you do as well, is things which are absolutely vegan, but they're not labeling it that way. They're not marketing it that way. They're just like, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's great. You know, it's just plant based. But I said to her and I always say to people when I do consulting, you would help people who are looking for plant based so much if you just added a little V mark or something, you know? <laughs> Like maybe yeah. think about making it very clear because I think we're at the phase in Japan right now where even if things have a V mark or vegan mark, we're a bit skeptical because we're like, do they really get it? Is that true? You know, and then if some things are vegan, but they're not labeled, it's, it seems like a missed opportunity. So I really... I hope in the next few years, we're going to start to see more like a standardized label system or some kind of uh, mark that all the products are able to adopt. It, it seems kind of confusing right now in Japan, right? Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's actually part of a bigger discussion, and it's a shame because Japan is, uh, compared to a lot of other countries, the, the labeling rules are a bit lax. The, the laws and regulations regarding labeling is a bit lax. So it might have to be part of a bigger discussion because um, just for context, things like uh, when they label um, the ingredients of like the salad dressing that you find in a convenience store, it's you know one of many things. And often you will see like sonota, a flavoring or um, th there's ways that they're allowed to um, just sum up things that are I forgot but under like a certain percentage of the whole product and sometimes you will find that uh, where the sonota the etc is that's where you find like the the one animal uh, derivative um, but currently um, no, none of the manufacturers um, actually have to disclose that obviously if you ask them they, they can tell you but um, sometimes they themselves don't even know because they don't they're not obliged to track it or disclose it so they don't really check and so maybe somewhere along the production line or or where they got the materials from it's animal deriv derivative but they don't know um, so yeah like I said I think it's part of a bigger discussion because if that's not sort of put in order it's a bit hard to then standardize um marking these things but I, I agree that that woman should put on a little v mark yeah because and help, like they're help they're me. making um what is it some kind of amazing summer squash pumpkin soup which is you know she makes it she packages it it's in the tokyo markets but it's all vegan and it doesn't have the mark and i was like oh please put the mark i'm sure there's people who are seeking that out you know yeah I definitely agree. um there's also two uh talks that i did one with oheso and they also they're an amazing bakery they have vegan pizza with a sourdough crust and everything and and they also do it online uh, Tere Koko in Okayama. I don't think she sells online, but if you ever visit Okayama, she's a great resource in that area. Um, there are more and more good places. What what do you use for uh, resource when you're looking around? Do you use Happy Cow or? I think um, sadly Happy Cow was. I haven't looked at it recently, but uh, when I first came back to Japan, it wasn't as uh jam-packed let's say as, as i found it in other countries um so i kind of just looked online or um now that we sort of have a, a good following slash following back on instagram i do see that it's actually faster and more reliable to get information from the sort of the community um you can follow us we'll share stuff but i'm um, also just trying to follow some of the plant-based slash vegan vegetarian um, people on Instagram, um, they do tend to pick things up a lot faster. So uh, faster than, you know, what you can find on Google. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that recently, that's been my main source. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's true, isn't it? Because um, Google Maps, when you're searching for a vegan vegetarian near you, it often pops up recommendations for yakiniku barbecue houses. And you're like, really? No, no. <laughs> 
Maybe yes. it's the, the review that some poor vegan wrote that, oh, they, they accommodated, you know, only yeah. vegetable skewers or something. And then that maybe pops up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but that but that is true. That's something that um, when I do tourism travel consulting with destinations and they always say, well, of course, for the inbound market, everybody wants Wagyu beef and and our chicken and all the all the meats. And I say, but don't forget, you know, have at least one vegan vegetarian option because Usually, even inside a group of meat eaters, there's going to be one or two who are vegan, vegetarian, or even flexitarian who want to choose that vegan, vegetarian option, right? Yeah. Or, or maybe they're just sick of eating meat every day or <laughs> fish every day while they're in Japan, and they want something. So having one option in your restaurant or in your tourist destination is always a good idea, is yeah, something I, I always recommend, right? Not yeah. not just some cabbage. Country, <laughs> yeah, not just cabbage and fries. I think some country in Europe recently they're trying to switch the default. Might have been Belgium. I, I might be wrong, but um, they're trying to switch the default to you should have uh, all your stuff vegan, and then sort of add-ons could be non-vegan. So like an example of like a sandwich store or a salad bar where if you don't do anything, it's vegan. And then you can add cheese, you can add, you know, Absolutely. chicken on it. Yeah. I think, yeah, that would be easier, at least obviously from my perspective. But no, yeah. ab absolutely. That's something I, I always recommend, right? Like you start with a vegan base, but that yeah. is usually the big uh, argument because they say we have to have uh, dashi that has uh, chicken or we have to have dashi. Dashi is soup stock, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know. Um, we have to use fish because that's that's the umami flavor. That's the real Japanese flavor. But I've I've had so many amazing dishes made from a shiitake mushroom umami flavor for the dashi or a vegan dashi. You know? So when you meet people who are invested in researching a vegan dashi, then they can just build, like you say, you can add cheese, add egg, add meat, add fish later, and then you've got the base which you can sell to everybody, you know? So yeah. it, it makes it a lot easier. I see that you're doing kimchi. Kimchi is really hard to find vegan. How did yeah. you do that? So um, I think I also wrote in the excerpt in the recipe, but um, I went through a phase of making kimchi like fermented. Um, it stunk out the whole house. And so I kind of went away from that. And then, um, just experimenting with sort of the the chili flavor and then the sourness that's in the kimchi i arrived at um, there's a recipe on the website but basically it's a non-fermented sort of cheap version um but yeah like you said it's so hard to find um uh, kimchi that doesn't have um animals and it's all vegetables but then they always you know somehow find squid squid something in there or i think it's um to get the again the umami uh, Koreans, I think, do this too, but uh, there's um, they try to put, uh, it, not intestine, I guess it's an intestine of um, some kind of fish or squid. Um, so you don't really taste it, you don't really see it, but it's there, and sometimes they use shrimp. So um, I just started making it at home because you just have to cut up the cabbage, mix it in the paste, and literally you're done. Um, you won't get the full nutritional benefits of a fermented kimchi, but um, I'm okay, you know, I just have natto for the probiotics, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, I really enjoyed listening to your podcast with uh, Motainai Transition. And we also had Helene on the series. Um, and you were talking about some resources or media that you enjoyed watching. And you mentioned Cowspiracy. Do you have any other recommendations? You want to introduce that? Yeah, so if you don't really know about the whole scene and you're interested in the environmental impact, definitely Cowspiracy is like the one thing and then like, like answers your questions, I think. Um, one thing I did enjoy watching recently is uh, also on Netflix called Okja, O-K-J-A. Um, it's actually not a documentary, it's more of a film. Um, it's a Korean film. Um, but uh, if you watch it, you'll see, uh, I won't spoil anything, um, but it gets you thinking about um, the modern day uh, way that we eat meat. So Okuja is the name of the, the pig. And then there's a main character who is a little girl who's like 10. And it's basically that little story. It's, it's quite touching, um, but in a, in a funny, weird way, um, the whole film kind of depicts 
and sort of emphasizes the what's what would be wrong um, about eating meat, but not in a very exaggerated way, right? So it, it kind of gets you thinking, I think, um, wow, is this what we've been? I don't eat pork anymore, but it really got me thinking like, wow, I used to, I used to eat pork. Wow, like, like I don't know how I did that. So it's it's something. It's a nice watch. Um, it's also very touching with a happy ending. Um, so you know, nice to watch on a Friday, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll definitely check that out. I really enjoyed watching the Game Changers. Have you heard of that? Mm, yes, I watched that as well. There's there's pros and cons of that. Um, I've heard lots of arguments against it too. So I loved it. Um, but I'm not sure that I I always want to you know push that one. Um, but it is true, like the science that they they cite, um, it's it's proven science that is written in a book that I always recommend, and it's called the China Study. It's a bit of a big book, um, but if you're one of those people who prefer to to actually read stats and sciences, um, it's written by a two doctors um, who have really researched the effects of uh, plant-based eating on your health, and they do also touch on um, sort of muscle and you know on the broader aspects of health as well. So yeah, game changes if you don't have time. But I would say read China Study. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea um, and really good to have a variety of input of knowledge. I think and and the knowledge and the research is always changing, and it's always a good idea to also look at where the funding comes from. Like yeah. the whole idea of the food pyramid in America was sponsored by the meat and dairy industry for many years. Um, so you have to think about that. And, and of course, they're going to recommend meat and dairy then, you know, and then how yeah. uh, over time they wanted to have a plant based diet as plant based proteins as recommended. And they got a lot of pressure from the industry. So it's really yeah. good to have a variety of knowledge coming in from different sources and then make your own best best uh understanding and make your own best choices that suit your your lifestyle i would say um yeah we, i couldn't agree more we we have a few yeah. more minutes what's what's your future targets you have anything up and coming yeah so it's interesting uh you mentioned a land from multi night transition we actually met through um uh, mr walsh who i believe has also been on these series um he does urban farming um, so this is all connected, it's interesting. But um, yeah, I met Ellen through him and we really got on well. And she's passionate about sustainability as a whole and she does consulting to help you transition to a more sustainable life. Um, and, you know, as you know, I'm sort of focused on Regino where I'm trying to promote like a transition again to more plant-based eating. Um, so we're actually starting a new project. Uh, very exciting. We're trying to map out um, uh, uh, an app, a map, Sorry, it is an app and it's also a map um, to help you uh, really pursue that transition. Um, like you said, it's hard to know if things are not labeled, if things are not on Google, then it's hard to know which places would accommodate your choices. Not necessarily plant-based, by the way, it could be plastic free, zero waste. Um, and so we're really trying to address that problem together. Um, and hopefully in the coming months, you will see uh, more from us. Um, on that and hopefully it's uh, it'll come to light as an app. We are looking at it to be um, mapping out uh, all of Japan, hopefully the world. <laughs> but yeah, stay tuned for that. Yeah, I thought that's a really great idea. Um, so having like an app based information about where sustainable shopping choices or eating choices are, but just focused on that and then consumer inputted data so people can get advice from others a bit easier. Um, I did attend the Google conference last year at Google headquarters for Google Guides. And I did suggest that Google do this because of course they're the main thing that everybody's using. And I got a few nods of sympathy, but no, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> you know, the CEO has a, has a personal um, Google map, you know, whatever his, he created a list, uh, for vegan vegetarian foods around the world because he's, uh, I believe he's plot-based. Oh, okay. Well, uh, and I've, so I've created, do yeah, I've created lists and that's what they suggested. They said, you can make lists. Um, but I think right. something that you're doing, which is very focused on just that, 
just yeah. is it sustainable or not and what are your parameters for sustainability it's kind yeah. of it's more individualistic but if you think about the community effort we're going to have kind of a new definition of the reality of sustainability in Japan so i'm really excited about you guys' project and i i think i'm going to be part of it so i i hope to help you guys out of it <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it'd be awesome. So maybe we'll we'll do a follow up talk just about that uh, with you and Helen uh, in a few months' time once you get it started and get going. Yeah. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights on Vigino and all of the wonderful things that you're doing. And I'm wishing you best of luck. A bit, as a new parent, as well as <laughs> all of your initiatives that you're trying. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for your comments today. And uh, please join us again tomorrow, 5 p.m. We're talking to Jared Campion, Champion, Campion, about an uh, innovative new way to travel around Japan. So join us at 5 tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.